This, this is session number 26, the concluding session of Biblical Backgrounds. I'm Dr. John McMath, uh, here together with my friends uh, in the US, in Italy, and in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, we've been enjoying several months of studying the uh, context, the background of uh, the biblical text uh, as a way of uh, illustrating and helping to understand uh, what the Bible says. Um, I've, uh, I've said many times, I don't believe that uh, uh, archaeology or history or the rest uh, really ought to be used to prove the Bible. I don't think the Bible needs proof. Uh, I think they, the greatest proof that uh, the Bible ever had was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he came back from the tomb, uh, when he showed himself alive, uh, everything that he ever said uh, about everything, including the accuracy of the Bible, uh, was verified. Uh, and they're really, for those of us who are believers, that that answers the questions. Um, so does the Bible need proof beyond the resurrection? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, but much of, uh, much of the background of the Bible is helpful for us to understand a, a bit better what's going on. It's for us. It's not no, I, I don't use backgrounds to um, argue with non-believers. It doesn't help. Okay, today we're going to uh, we're going to look at uh, the uh, uh, archaeological background of the text of the New Testament. Uh, and uh, when I talk about that, let me sh let me share share a, a screen here. I'll show you what I mean when I say the uh, text of the New Testament. See if this comes up. There it is. Uh, Archaeology and the New Testament text. The text is this thing on the left. That's a piece of papyrus with a fragment of the New Testament written on it. Uh, it's actually quite easy to read for people who practiced just a little. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the Greek is written uh, complete with spaces between the words. They're not very big spaces, but there are spaces. It doesn't have punctuation. Uh, and every once in a while, there's a little something, very small letters written into the text. This is a, an original manuscript copy of a portion of the New Testament. Uh, and uh, people are uh, often wondering what, what's going on? What do we mean we were studying that, the text? Uh, the, the New Testament was written in Greek in much the same way that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. They're written in different languages. They were written by hand on papyrus or some kind of leather. Uh, papyrus uh, was the original writing material for uh, the New Testament authors. Uh, it was a material that was made in Egypt from the papyrus reed. Uh, the English word paper comes from the word papyrus. You take the papyrus reed and split it lengthwise uh, actually, the leaves, I, I believe, and um, put it together in a left-right, 90-degree-off pattern, and then press it under under some weights. Uh, and the the natural glue-like substance in the reeds glues everything together, and it makes a surprisingly durable. Uh, paper-like substance. And papyrus was the most common writing material in the Mediterranean world at the time of Christ. Uh, it was much, much less expensive than leather or the, the various alternatives. Um, the uh, uh, New Testament uh, manuscripts in Greek 
are represented uh, by well over 5,000 individual manuscripts uh, dating uh, from the, uh, uh, the earliest papyrus fragment that we have of the New Testament dates to the early second century. Uh, and it goes all the way through late antiquity and into the Middle Ages up until the invention of printing in the 15th century. Uh, obviously, the early copies are rare. Uh, we have uh, only a few hundred from the early centuries. Uh, and as the time goes on, as there are more and more Christians and more and more churches and more and more uh, scribes making copies, uh, the population growing, uh, there were more and more copies of the New Testament available. So we would expect that of the 5,000 that we have, most of them are relatively late, the 8th and 9th centuries and later. But we do have a lot of early manuscripts, uh, and there are lots and lots of them. They've been found in a variety of places. Uh, sometimes uh, the work is done by uh, just archaeologists, uh, as particularly in Egypt, uh, places like uh, uh, Nag Hammadi and uh, Elephantine are a couple of places along the Nile uh, where archaeologists have discovered rolled up bunches of, uh, of papyrus. Uh, and uh, those manuscripts uh, are added to the pile. Uh, with uh, thousands of different manuscripts. Of course, uh, non-believers uh, would love to be able to say that with 5,000 different manuscripts, there've got to be 25,000 different errors. Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is uh, we find uh, through a careful study of the text of all of these manuscripts, fragments, complete Bibles, we find that the text of the Bible uh, is very stable uh, and has remained the same throughout most of its history. Uh, I'll, I'll say that again in a couple of other ways uh, because it's, um, it's important. Uh, by using a, the, uh, the scientific method that we call textual criticism, uh, scholars have been able to track the lineage of every manuscript, uh, and they can identify the errors that are made by scribes uh, and the differences that crept into the tradition in specific geographic locations. Uh, so we, uh, for the early years, we make a distinction between the Western text and the uh, uh, Eastern text, the Alexandrian text and the Western or Roman text, uh, because the, the two places are geographically separate. And when several copies are made of copies, uh, different sorts of errors came in and in both places, but it's possible to track those down and, uh, and to understand why they happened. Uh, later on, uh, during the Byzantine period, they, the later Roman period centered in Constantinople, uh, the, uh, the text was put back together again. Uh, and we, we know what happened and we can track most of what happened. A lot of this is very, very detailed work. Uh, but the bottom line is that the New Testament has by far the largest number of manuscripts of any ancient book, anything, including Plato and Aristotle, Homer, uh, for that matter, there are more manuscripts of the Bible than there are of Shakespeare. And yet who doubts that Shakespeare wrote his plays? You know, we, we all know that he did. Uh, if, I guess uh, some scholars think maybe he didn't. Some some other guy also named Shakespeare wrote them, but most of us don't worry about that. The New Testament, on the other hand, has well over 5,000 manuscripts, most of which agree very well with one another. Uh, other religious texts are often represented by just a very few 
uh, manuscripts. For example, in uh, uh, the Hindu tradition, uh, there's a very ancient Sanskrit uh, text called the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, we have a handful of early manuscripts of the Bhagavad Gita uh, written or copied within a thousand years of uh, the beginning of that particular strain. Uh, the Quran uh, has no manuscripts at all earlier than the 10th century. Uh, and what we have have been corrected. That is, they've been they've been cleaned up so that all of the manuscripts that exist uh, are essentially identical. Uh, and there are very very few of those. Uh, the uh, Quranic studies does not allow for the archaeological study of earlier versions of the Quran. Uh, several have been found, but they've been destroyed. Um, why is that? You have to ask questions like that. Um, no really ancient manuscript tradition of the Quran can be checked out. Uh, the, here in America, we've got a religion called Mormonism or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, they don't believe in Jesus and they're not saints, but they're often very nice people. And they've got their Book of Mormon and it claims uh, to have come from uh, manuscripts that were written on golden plates. But unfortunately, those golden plates have never been seen. And they were written in a language which has never been discovered. And so there's no way to check out anything. You just have to believe the stories of the huckster that originally sold them. Uh, in the meantime, while all of that was going on, the New Testament has been widely published uh, and the manuscript evidence is widely available ever since the Reformation. Uh, so if you're wondering uh, what, uh, what ancient manuscripts uh, support this specific reading of a text in the New Testament, you can just open up your Greek Bible and find out. I'll show you how that works uh, in uh, just a little bit. So let's uh, let's really take a look at some of these. Uh, let's see if I can get this going. Okay. Uh, some of my favorite manuscript um, evidence is what are called the unctual manuscripts. Unctual is just a Latin word that means capital letters, all written all in capital letters and without a lot of spacing. Uh, the uh, image on the right is a manuscript called Sinaiticus. And the picture in the background is the uh, monastery on Mount Sinai called St. Catherine's. Back at the end of the uh, 19th century, a uh, uh, German uh, scholar named uh, uh, Tischendorf went to Mount Sinai and uh, found, among other things, uh, a, a great stash of uh, biblical manuscripts. Uh, the most important that he found uh, is called Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, and the, um, the code letter for Sinaiticus is the Hebrew letter Aleph. Uh, this, is, this is the oldest and probably most important of the manuscripts that we have. This is Sinaiticus. Uh, this includes uh, most of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament with just a couple of fragments missing at the end. Uh, the uh, manuscript uh, was uh, uh, given to Tsar Nicholas at the time in return for a variety of, uh, of favors. Later on, the manuscript was sold to England, and today it resides in the British Museum. And uh, I've only seen it under glass uh, in a climate controlled area in the British Museum in London. Uh, this is our oldest complete New Testament manuscript. Uh, it dates to about 350 AD. Uh, we believe that Sinaiticus 
was one of a group of um, codex or book shaped manuscripts uh, that were um, ordered by uh, the Emperor Constantine. Constantine uh, reportedly became a Christian in 312. And uh, during his career, he tried to build up the church. And in general, that was a good thing. Uh, not a great thing, but it, it was all right. Among other things, he said that every large church ought to have a copy of the whole Bible. And so the Old Testament in Greek, the Septuagint, and the New Testament, also in Greek, uh, were uh, made by professional scribes uh, in book form with pages, not, uh, not simple scrolls. So this was a really cool thing. Uh, we know that Constantine ordered 300 of those made. Uh, we've, uh, we found just a few of them. Uh, and uh, Codex Sinaiticus is the, the oldest and the most complete that we have. Uh, Vaticanus uh, is uh, uh, found in Rome also by uh, Tischendorf. It dates to around 340 AD, but it's not complete. Uh, it's a very important manuscript, but um, uh, it leaves out some portions. Uh, from Alexandria in Egypt, uh, we get uh, a, a manuscript called Alexandrinus, uh, and it has the uh, code letter uh, A. Uh, this was given to the British by uh, the Turkish Empire back way back in 1624. Uh, it came to the British Museum in 1757. Uh, and uh, it's not quite complete, dates to about 425 AD. Uh, there are uh, at least 250 other uh, large unctual manuscript uh, copies of uh, most of the Bible uh, that were written between or copied between the third and the fifth centuries uh, AD. Uh, and all of those are accessible to us. In addition to the unctuals, which is the capital letters, we have about 2,600 so-called minuscules. Minuscule simply means uh, uh, lowercase letters. Uh, so from the ninth until the 15th centuries, uh, uh, scribes began writing in lowercase. The ninth century is when uh, a character by the name of Charlemagne, uh, whom historians tell us may or may not have existed, but at any rate, during Charlemagne's time, uh, the scribes began using some of the uh, some of the formats that uh, we find in modern writing. So they began putting spaces between letters. Uh, they began leaving margins, they began using punctuation, they began using paragraphs. Uh, it was really helpful. Uh, they also began putting verses in the Bible. Uh, so we'll, we'll find that once in a while in the minuscules. There are lots and lots and lots of minuscules. In addition to the unctuals and the minuscules, uh, another even less authoritative source, uh, is uh, uh, what we call the um, um, uh, the uh, uh, missals or uh, prayer books. There are uh, lots and lots of uh, books that were available in the churches that had readings for special days and that sort of thing. And we just have thousands of those. Uh, these date from anywhere from the 7th to the 15th century. Uh, all of them written by hand, uh, and uh, all of them of some value to us. Before there were ever codex manuscripts, there were papyri. And the papyrus is really, uh, it's hard to, uh, to overestimate the importance of the papyri. Uh, papyrus itself was made in Egypt, and most of the papyrus manuscripts that we find 
uh, were found in Egypt uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries, the earliest ones that we found. They were assigned to a, a variety of institutions all over the world in 1900 by the old Egyptian Exploration Fund, which was a British run organization. Uh, papyrus, we need to think about papyrus for just a second. I told you how it's made. Uh, we used to think 50 years ago when I was in school, one of the articles of faith was that papyrus was used because it was cheap and uh, uh, easy to make, but didn't last very long. So people would use papyrus for quick notes that they didn't expect to last very long. And we believed in those days that the scribes who wrote the New Testament manuscripts uh, were amateurs, uh, just well-meaning Christians who felt the need for another copy of the Book of Romans. Um, who can blame them? What we're discovering through actually a complete field of study of uh, uh, the ancient world that we call papyrology uh, is that papyrus was not cheap. It was cheaper than leather, but it was not cheap. Uh, and uh, eventually it would be cut off entirely. Uh, when uh, uh, the Arabs took over North Africa, it became impossible for Europeans to get papyrus. And so leather scrolls were, uh, were made after the seventh century AD. And it's much more expensive, uh, but papyrus was not cheap. It was also not short-lived. Uh, uh, we've always thought that papyrus would just uh, turn to dust after a few years. That in fact is not true. Uh, much of the papyrus that we actually see today uh, is thousands of years old, so it doesn't automatically turn to dust. If it gets wet, it will dissolve, it will rot. Uh, but papyrus that's kept in dry storage can last for centuries. Uh, in the fifth century or sixth century, the 500s AD, the church at Ephesus claim to have in its possession a complete collection of Paul's original letters uh, stored in safe circumstances for the day uh, there in Ephesus. So that's 500 years after Paul wrote them, the original letters uh, were still available for other scribes to check. Uh, the, the idea that uh, manuscripts only lasted a couple of years and had to be copied constantly is simply not correct. And the idea that uh, manuscripts couldn't be checked against the original because the original is long gone is also not correct. Uh, there's reason to believe that uh, the papyrus copies of the New Testament were done by professional scribes. There's a, a lot of uh, a lot of technical argument for that. As we look at the the formation of the letters and the the way the uh, materials were uh, laid out and set up, uh, it's obvious that this was done by very experienced people who actually knew what they were doing, uh, not just literate Christians who meant well, but uh, professional scribes, and often professional non-Christian scribes. Uh, and we can tell that from uh, a lot of the, the background of it. Uh, the papyrus uh, is uh, gradually increasing. We're, uh, uh, when I was in school 50 years ago, uh, we knew of, I believe, 67 uh, papyrus manuscripts that included most of the New Testament and were very important pieces, uh, and everybody was very happy to have them. Uh, today, uh, my uh, Greek Testament lists 127 papyrus manuscripts. These date to the earliest years of the Christian era. Uh, they, they go all the way back to the first 
three centuries, four centuries of the church. Uh, none of them are complete copies of the, uh, of the New Testament, uh, but they're older and less tradition bound than the great unctual manuscripts. The great unctual manuscripts are the place where we start, but we also look at the papyrus, which is older. We just, uh, common sense would tell you that the older material is closer to the original source and so is more likely to be correct. And in general, that's true. And so we'll correct our unctual manuscripts against our papyrus manuscripts. Well, we find all kinds, of, all kinds of neat stuff. Together, when we look at the, the papyrus, the unctual manuscripts, and then the, the later Byzantine manuscript uh, tradition of minuscules and prayer books and whatnot, uh, we have an unparalleled source for following up on any problems that we might find in the text of the New Testament. Uh, I want to show you some specific papyrus that, that we have names for uh, at a place called Oxyrhynchus. And believe it or not, that's Oxyrhynchus in the, in the uh, upper right. Uh, we found a, a, a collection of uh, manuscripts uh, that we call the Chester Beatty Papyrus uh, Collection. It's a very large collection. There's uh, uh, many thousands of pages. Uh, it, uh, the New Testament and biblical manuscripts uh, include uh, almost the entire New Testament and most of the Greek Old Testament, uh, along with a whole bunch of other stuff, secular documents, uh, things like... Um, uh, contracts and wills and anything that's worth writing down for uh, posterity. These date, the Oxyrhynchus papyrus, the Chester Beatty collection, mostly dates to the third and early fourth century. So we're talking uh, in the 200s. Uh, the oldest of them dates to about 220 AD and the, uh, the later ones go on into the, into the 300s AD. Uh, so these are considerably older than our unctual manuscripts. These were produced by scribes uh, during the period when Christianity was still illegal. Uh, and virtually the entire old, uh, old and New Testament are available here. This gives us a very good check on our later manuscripts. At uh, a place called Nag Hammadi, also in Egypt, uh, we find a whole bunch of material written by the Gnostics. Uh, Gnostics are one of the most interesting of the uh, non-Christian opposition groups uh, during the uh, post-biblical era. Uh, there's, uh, there's some really interesting uh, false gospels, uh, including the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas, uh, which have come up in popular literature lately, uh, uh, people say, oh boy, it's a gospel of Thomas, all kinds of stuff that nobody has ever heard of before. Uh, none of these, uh, and uh, this is the important point about the, uh, the so-called Gnostic gospels, uh, none of these were accepted outside of their limited Gnostic culture. Uh, so the, the Gospel of Thomas exists in, I believe, four manuscript copies, um, and, and they're all found here at Nag Hammadi. Uh, so outside of Nag Hammadi, what impact did the Gospel of Thomas ever have? Well, the simple answer is none at all. <laughs> Nobody ever read it. Uh, nobody copied it. Uh, it wasn't passed on for generations. There is no church built around the uh, so-called Gospel of Thomas. And the same is true with the Gospel of Judas. As far as I know, we have only one copy of the Gospel of Judas. Uh, it dates to the, um, uh, the fourth century AD. 
uh, it was clearly not written by Judas. Uh, and it was made up by the Gnostics to support their heresy. Uh, and it has had no impact on anyone anywhere in all of history. Uh, so for the, the critics to come at us and say, oh, look, here's a gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Judas, these other Gnostic gospels, these were alternatives that were suppressed by the church. They weren't suppressed by the church. Uh, they were, if anything, ignored by the church because they weren't written by apostles. They weren't written at the right time in history. Uh, and they don't agree with the rest of the Bible and they have no spiritual significance. Uh, it, it, they, they get none of the check marks uh, for an authentic part of the New Testament canon. And so they're simply written off. Uh, the church didn't need to suppress these things. They just died. Okay, they're still interesting. Um, it's uh, uh, the Nag Hammadi Gnostic texts are interesting into the language and the culture of the time. And uh, uh, it's helpful for historians to know what the heresies were like. That's what we look at those. Let me show you three specific manuscripts that are uh, actually really, really important. Um, uh, starting at the right-hand side, we'll go right to left. Uh, P46 is Papyrus 46. It's part of the larger Chester Beatty Papyrus collection. Uh, P45 uh, includes a complete collection of the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Uh, P46 uh, is uh, uh, eight of Paul's letters and the Book of Hebrews which is very interesting for people who argue that uh, uh, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. The Chester Beatty Papyrus has that uh, right there. Uh, this particular uh, manuscript was probably set down about 200 AD, about a hundred years after the uh, end of the New Testament period. Uh, it's certainly a copy. Uh, you can tell because the, the handwriting uh, the scribal signatures are the same all the way through. So one scribe put together this entire collection, uh, and it's really, really beautiful. Uh, uh, P52 is this little fragment in, uh, in the middle. This is the oldest biblical papyrus that we found so far. There's another that I haven't seen published yet uh, that uh, may be a part of the Gospel of Mark uh, and may be older than uh, the John Ryland's uh, P52, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but P52 is the oldest one we have. Uh, it dates uh, clearly uh, to no later than 125 AD. We can tell that because of the, the, the shape of the letters uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the layer of the tell that this was found in. It can't be any later than 125. It may be earlier than that. Uh, this is a portion of the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John uh, and is absolutely uh, the oldest copy we have of the Gospel of John. Uh, there are uh, some scholars who have suggested uh, that this, uh, uh, this manuscript may have been produced during the lifetime of John himself. Yes, so it's a precious piece. Uh, those of us uh, who, uh, who work with this stuff have uh, resisted saying uh, that this is the original uh, written by John. Uh, I would never say that because almost certainly somebody would insist on building a church on top of it. And we don't want to see that happen. The um, uh, P66 is the sheaf of letters on, uh, on the left. That's called the Bodmer papyrus. Uh, Bodmer, Rylands, and Beatty are, um, of course, uh, people, but these are the names of libraries that hold these manuscripts. P66 uh, was uh, copied about 200 AD, and it includes 
uh, about uh, two thirds of the Gospel of John uh, and is easily our earliest copy of the Gospel of John. So what, uh, there's some others that are also interesting. These are some of our earliest. The papyrus pushed back the history of the New Testament uh, by nearly 200 years prior to the 19th century when we began finding the papyrus fragments uh, our earliest manuscripts uh, were really quite late fourth and fifth centuries uh, this pushes our our knowledge of the text of the new testament all the way back to essentially the new testament era uh, or within 50 years there is secondly remarkable verbal agreement among the, the copies of the papyrus uh, and the later unctuals and the minuscules that go beyond. Remarkable level of uh, agreement. Scribal errors always happen. Uh, we'll, we'll never find a perfect manuscript because when you're copying things by hand, mistakes happen. Uh, sometimes we'll find little corrections uh, put into the text because the scribe following up on his work has discovered he made an error. Uh, but what we do find is uh, a remarkable high level agreement of the manuscripts with one another. There's simply no embarrassment here. Uh, the, the people who argue that there are just thousands of scribal errors all over the New Testament have never really handled the material. When you actually take the time to, one, learn the language, and two, get access to the, uh, the primary source material, you discover that the, uh, the differences between manuscripts are very, very small. Okay, third thing is that the whole philosophy of New Testament uh, uh, origins has been changed in particularly the left-wing circles. Um, today, it's obvious to anybody who is open to the evidence that the New Testament was written during the first century. There's no other way to explain the existence of these manuscripts. Uh, then uh, uh, fourthly, there's a complete change of attitude toward New Testament Greek. Uh, there was a time uh, in which scholars believed that the New Testament was written in a kind of Holy Spirit Greek because they didn't recognize the Greek. Uh, today we know that the, the language of the Greek New Testament is the language of the Greek papyrus. Uh, and was a koine, a common language uh, in the Mediterranean world. And then finally, there's a tremendous contribution of these papyrus fragments to our understanding of the words of the New Testament uh, in their secular context. About 75 years ago, uh, one of the great reference books that scholars continue to use to this day was written by um, a couple of British scholars, Moulton and Milligan. They called it the vocabulary of the Greek Testament uh, as illustrated from the papyri. And so they go through all of the words that are used in the New Testament and show how these words were used in the, in the secular papyrus, in uh, wedding contracts and uh, rental agreements and legal sources and notes about stuff. <laughs> uh, we have we have just literally tons of, uh, of papyrus, and now we can begin to understand how these words were actually used. Mostly, that that hasn't made huge that hasn't made any changes in theology, but it helps us to understand better. And that's the whole point of backgrounds. Okay, let me show you one other slide, see if I can make it. This, uh, what you see here on the right, uh, is uh, my copy of the New Testament. This is the Nessel Alland Noam Testamentum Greek. Uh, this is the 28th edition. Uh, people wonder, 
uh, what use are all these thousands of manuscripts if they're all in museums someplace? And of course, they would be very hard to use if they were just limited to the museums. So fortunately, modern Greek New Testament editions provide up-to-date information gathered from all those manuscripts. Let me show you a page from the Greek New Testament. This is the uh, uh, first page of the Gospel of John in Greek. Okay, and I know it, it's Greek to me too, and it's okay. <laughs> and the, the main part of the page is the actual biblical text. That's the Greek text. Uh, and there are footnotes or side notes along both sides of the page. Those are cross-references to other parts of the Old and New Testament where these same phrases are used. Those can often be very helpful. At the bottom of the page is a series of footnotes. Uh, the, in the uh, text itself, there are little superscripts that send you to the footnotes. When you look at the footnotes, you'll see, first of all, the list of manuscripts that supports the text that has been printed here. Almost always, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the main text is the traditional text, the same text that we found in the text for 500 years. Uh, because very, very little changes. Uh, but the footnotes also provide other manuscript evidence. Uh, maybe there's, a, there's some ninth century minuscule that has a different reading for this verse. The New Testament that scholars use has a listing for each and every one of those. Uh, so we list them, uh, uh, we, we see a, a list of alternative readings, no matter how small those are, and the list of manuscripts that support the reading. Uh, sometimes it's supported by only one or two manuscripts. Uh, and even so, that's interesting. Uh, it's probably not something that will follow, uh, but it's interesting. Uh, scholars have the, the privilege and the obligation of checking out those textual problems every time they come to them. Most of the time, the traditional and generally accepted text is correct. There have been very, very few really significant changes in 500 years of the pr uh, printed edition of the New Testament. Uh, and on any given page, uh, you're going to find references to literally hundreds of different manuscripts that provide alternatives, sometimes with a little different spelling. Uh, sometimes word order will be different. Sometimes an entire letter or an entire word even might be uh, missing from one manuscript. Sometimes it's just a scribal error. Other times there's something more going on. Okay, that all that material helps us understand a little better the background to our own Bibles. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the text is just a part of biblical backgrounds, uh, recognizing all of this fits into a larger context. Uh, as we're approaching the conclusion of a course in biblical backgrounds, you know, what, what kind of conclusion can we make? What can we, what can we say? First of all, the Bible fits very well into its historical and chronological context. Uh, when we begin studying the context of the Bible, uh, the political context, the linguistic context, the, uh, uh, the uh, historical backgrounds, the geological and geographical and scientific backgrounds, we find that the Bible fits very well. It's as though it was actually written at the time it claims to be written by people who were actually there, uh, which is exactly what we would expect to find if the Bible is true. Uh, 
the Bible sits quite nicely in its geographical and political context in every era. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, geography stays the same, but the political names for places change. Uh, and the Bible recognizes those things and gives the proper names. And it uh, uh, speaks of how long it takes to walk a distance. Uh, those things are always accurate. So what do we conclude? The text of the Bible itself is remarkably well-preserved. The, the biblical text that we have, and by that I mean the Hebrew and Greek original manuscripts, uh, serves as an expert witness uh, to the events and to the ideas of the Bible. We've got a really, really, really good biblical text. Uh, and that biblical text tells a story and lays down a historical sequence that fits very well against its background. Uh, it, uh, it has what, uh, if I were uh, summarizing to a jury, I would say that the Bible has the ring of truth. Uh, it, it just sounds true. Uh, when, uh, uh, when, when you've listened to people lie, uh, and uh, then you've heard people tell the truth, it's really pretty easy to tell the difference. It's very difficult to tell a good lie uh, because it's too easy to cross check things. Uh, and, and the Bible can be cross checked in all different kinds of ways and it proves to be true. So, you know, I, today I've been talking about the Bible in its uh, Greek and Hebrew backgrounds and how we can trust that. But what about our modern languages, our modern translations of the Bible? Can we trust them? Um, well, point number one, we always lose something in a translation. Uh, and in some languages, we lose more than in other languages. Uh, and uh, so we always have to recognize that but we don't lose nearly as much as most non-specialists think. Uh, we get a, a, a surprisingly good picture, uh, particularly uh, modern, uh, well thought through uh, translations. Someone working in, in his uh, uh, upstairs office uh, doing a paraphrase of uh, some other translation may come up with a with a bad bit of Bible, uh, but the uh, the versions, the official translations into modern languages, are really well done. Uh, uh, they have to be, or they wouldn't sell. Uh, and uh, we really don't lose as much as you would think. We lose some. Uh, uh, I can't. Uh, I can't fix that exactly. Uh, I believe it will always be necessary as long as the church lives uh, to have scholars available who can translate the ancient languages. We always have to be able to check and every once in a great while uh, we'll have conversations about how to translate something uh, because we disagree and we think this way would be a better way of saying it than that. Uh, that doesn't change the underlying meaning, but we can argue about exactly what it means. And sometimes biblical backgrounds helps us to solve those problems. Secondly, our modern translations really provide us with everything that we really need to understand the gospel and the life that we're called to live. It's what we call faith and practice. Uh, there are no there are no translation controversies uh, that affect uh, the, the doctrine of the existence of God or the triunity of God or the deity of Christ. There aren't any translation translation problems there. Uh, there are no translation issues in the story of the the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, the Bible means exactly what it says there, and it doesn't matter what language you translate that into. 
Uh, those things are simply true. Uh, what Bible backgrounds can do for us is to provide color and texture, context to a story that is every bit as true today as it has always been. I'm not going to prove the Bible for you uh, by showing you maps and charts and background stuff. Uh, I'm going to help you understand a true story better than you've understood it before. Uh, so that's what this course has been about. I honestly hope that it's, uh, it's been some help along the way. I think I'm still on. Yeah, it looks like I'm still on. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, walking through this with you. Uh, you guys have been good students. Thanks for your patience. I do appreciate this. And, uh, this, this is the end for now. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, to wait for uh, Pastor Oscar and for the elders in Italy uh, to let me know if you'd like me to continue uh, with uh, another topic. I'd be happy to. Uh, or if we're going to take a break for a while, that's also good. At any rate, uh, we'll let everybody know uh, when, uh, when something more is going to happen. This has been fun. Thank you for, uh, uh, for coming along on this ride with me. I'm going to unmute here. Yeah. We, we appreciate all of you and uh, look Thank forward you, to, uh, to seeing you face to face again. It's, it's been, been a while, been too long. Thank you, Dr. Gunn. Ciao, you, ciao. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you ciao so a much. tutti. Yeah. Bye bye. You, Love y'all. So hey, Don. Thank ciao, you. Tutti. Brother ciao, Oscar. Tutti. Dr. Thank you for Jan. the pictures from Manala. I appreciate that. Thumbs up, my friend. Bye bye, Roger. See you. Thank grazie, you now. Grazie, boy. Bye bye. Bye, okay. everyone. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, Don. And Don, hey, Donna wants to get close enough. She can say hi, too. Oh, Donna. <laughs> hi, Donna. All right. Bye bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye. bye. See if bye. I've got my, uh, where's my thing? I'm I'm going to become the cursor if I can't find my cursor.